Welcome to the Metal Detecting Podcast, brought to you by XP Metal Detectors. We're digging the plugs and pinpointing the topics you want to hear. Now, here's your hosts, Dave Kimball and Grant Hansen. show is brought to you by XP Metal Detectors. XP Metal Detectors is a high-end innovative metal detector company with high-end metal detectors, coils, and pinpointers. For more information, go to xpmetaldetectors.com. For a dealer near you, try a Google search or go to xpteamusa.com. Hello and welcome to the Metal Detecting Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Kimball, coming to you from Central Oklahoma, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Grant Hansen, coming to you from New Jersey. You keeping safe over there? Yeah, I'm keeping safe, keeping in the house. We have got a stockpile of food, both non-perishable, frozen meats, um, <laughs> so we, we're pretty prepared. How about yourself? Well, we try and, and uh, I keep going to the grocery store every now and then. I haven't really stocked up because I just... I'm not that type of person to go in and spend three hundred fifty dollars on groceries or whatever, you know. <laughs> but it, it lately it's been it's been getting better now. But the last few weeks it was getting pretty tough buying groceries because you go in there and they don't have any bread, any cereal, any lunch meat, any you know. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I'm not the type of person to go out and spend that kind of money on groceries either. But my wife is, so I'm just trying to manage that balance of um, making sure we're getting along. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. staying sane and staying safe. So I've kind of had a compromise in some places, but um, we'll be okay. Yeah, yesterday we went to the Walmart, me and my wife, and we bought, uh, with our stuff, we bought like two little uh, personal hand sanitizers, uh, one for each yeah. of our cars, and they told us to put one back, and we were only allowed to buy one. Wow, yeah, I mean, our store is like rationing, like the meat, you can only buy, like if you're getting steak or chopped meat, you can only buy one. If you're getting chicken, and you can only buy one. Um, I guess they have to do that just to be fair because, you know, somebody would come in and buy 20 of them. Yeah, well, I can understand somebody buying four or five or, right. or something like that, but somebody buying two, you know? <laughs> yeah, come yeah. On. Our supermarket has a great service through Instacart where we can order online, and then I just pull up right in front. I pop my trunk. They put it right in. Don't have to get close to anybody. Uh, we pay through the app, and then we uh, – we're on our way, so um, we try, try to take advantage of that every, uh, every time we can. Yeah, I might start doing that because I hate grocery shopping or shopping altogether. So I think mm -hmm. that's a good. I think that's a good thing for me. I was, yeah, I'm afraid now though that they got so many people doing that now. I wonder how. Is there, a, is there a line at all? Do you have to wait a long time, or how is that working? There, there's a line as far as making an appointment. So let's say we ordered on Tuesday of last week. We weren't able to pick up till Saturday. Like, you have to schedule your time in advance. So right now, there are no available times for us to pick up. So we just keep checking to see when the next one comes. Um, otherwise, I'll just, I'll just go in the store and grab what I need to grab real quick. Uh, yeah yeah because i was thinking like even buying toilet paper and stuff does it just show it's out of stock or does it show like, you know it's made? pretty cool you've got like a personal shopper and they're going around for you and if you've put something on your list that they don't have they'll either tell you or they can make a substitution right so we would say oh we wanted arnold whole wheat bread and they're like oh we don't have arnold we have this brand is that okay and they're doing it real time so it, it's really cool okay so if they're out of toilet paper they give you like head of lettuce <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, that might just do the trick, right? <laughs> dry it out, it'd be um, fine. Yeah. yeah How's so, your uh, granddaughter doing with being home so much and can't see her friends and everything? Oh, she's driving me crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it was my daughter's eighth birthday this week, and, you know, we just couldn't really do much, so we just tried to make her have a fun day at home, and, you know, I decorated my car that said, you know, honk, it's my eighth birthday, and drove around, and, you know, the problem is I'm from New Jersey, and everyone's rude here, so we didn't get any honks. You know, I should have cut them <laughs> off, then I would have gotten honks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you could have recorded a bunch of honks on your phone and just kind of played it every now and then when we're shooting and looking, and say, you hear that? Ah, I should have done that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, this virus thing is pretty crazy. I had to cancel my club meetings and cancel our hunts, and now I just sent out a mass email for everybody today saying, you know, that we may be missing next month also, and maybe even the month after that. We don't know. And we're going to be yeah. losing a lot of uh, money coming in for the club for our big hunt at the end of the year. So we may end up having to cancel that if we don't get enough. So we may be just have to start concentrating on next year. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're supposedly looking toward April 30th as that next key date. But I, I think it's going to be more like Memorial Day if we're lucky. Um, and what I'm afraid of is like if they start relaxing stuff and people stop washing their hands, they're getting close to people and they're still infected. Like, are we just going to spread it all over again? Yeah. I was listening to a couple of experts, disease specialists on other podcasts, and uh, two of them had a lot in common to say. They said that uh, both of them said that by mid-April is going to be the peak of this virus they expect anyways. Mm -hmm. And they said that after that, it's going to start declining and they figure uh, maybe a little through May and uh, by June, we should be getting pretty clear and like you said do we go back too early or not you know that's all to be said still and uh we'll have to find out but probably by may or uh, june july we'll be back in the clear but uh i just hopefully we don't have anything come back like this next year and in the flu season right yeah, it's, it's scary to think about, you know, and at least here in the United States, we can still go metal detecting and isolate ourselves in a field or on a property and, and not get close to anybody. But but our friends over in England, they're on lockdown. They they are they can't go metal detecting. They're allowed to go out one day, one hour a day, I think, for exercise and uh, walk your dog, whatever. But, oh, wow. um, you know, they've got it pretty tough over there. Really? I, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. See, here it's but, just so it's so weird because they had so many diseases before like this like SARS and and H1N1 and all that and and it's crazy how how we're handling this and what's going to happen with this is this going to really make a difference or change is this going to change the way everything is every year from now on or is something going to change you know out of this yeah that's a great question and it just might you know life may be different from now on uh, maybe hopefully yeah. maybe this will push something for the FDA to release vaccines a little quicker and maybe faster studiers studying. They have a few vaccines that they are pushing right now and they are advertising to the, uh, trying to get the FDA to really push it through. And, uh, maybe that's what will come out of this. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That would be good news. At least if they could push this one through a little bit more quickly <laughs> and get everybody safe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's funny with this virus, um, is that, you know, there's a lot of people like you, you and myself who are super busy right now with work and schoolwork, you know, that that doesn't stop for us. But for a lot of people, um, they can't work. So they're home. And, um, you know, what do you do? You start binge binge watching Netflix, right? And uh, (laughs) there's a great new show on Netflix now that's that's perfect timing for those binge watch opportunities. (laughs) Yeah, there is. Yeah, and you've been seeing a lot of memes on Facebook and Twitter and all that about the Tiger King. It's pretty funny. Yeah, you know, I haven't finished watching it yet. I'm, I'm only two oh, episodes haven't. in, but but I am hooked. Only uh, two so episodes. Let's not, I know. You I haven't know. got well, anywhere you know, yet. It's been you busy. Just, yeah, you're just finding out what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, but yeah, you, you came up with the best thing today. I, I posted a picture of myself from high school with my mullet, and, and you put me side by side with Joe Exotic, and I was just—it was brilliant. Yeah, the, yeah, it's uncanny. You, he's, he's, he's probably your long lost uncle. I think <laughs> he might be. He might be. Now he's from Oklahoma, right? Is that uh, where this park is? Yes, it's in Oklahoma. I used to drive by it all the time, and I'm going to Texas and back. And- and you drive by this big old sign, GW Animal Parks, and it uh-huh. would advertise it off of Winniewood. And, uh, yeah, it's funny because when all of this was going down, it was all over the news all the time about this guy. And, you know, I never, never even heard of the guy, but you've seen his pictures all the time on the news and about this and that. Uh, supposedly uh, they were, were concerned about him uh, killing animals, I guess, on, on the site. And then all of a sudden he was arrested for uh, plotting to kill uh, Carol Baskin. Uh-huh. <laughs> 
Yeah. Right, right. And, and you know, her cold case now has been reopened for the disappearance of her husband, who Joe Exotic and some others believe that she fed him to the tigers. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, and I don't think he really even put out an actual hit on her, even though that all that. I mean, he makes a really good case there towards the end of the show where he, you know, I hate to spoil it for you, but, you know, he tells him, he says, well, this guy that was working for the guy that took over the park, would not do anything for him because he kept saying he worked for the other guy. But then all of a sudden, this guy took three thousand dollars for him and went out and do a hit for him. You know, so mm. it was kind of like, yeah. But overall, other than that, that he was doing a lot of crazy stuff. He was shooting the tigers on site and burying them in the in there, and he was doing a lot of stuff like that, which was really not good. No, certainly not like the hero that people are making him out to be. You know, like uh, I see things that say uh, Joe Exotic. 2020 for president and that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. So, but it, it's if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. It'll, it'll help uh, pass some of your days or nights and uh, yeah. bring you some. It's definitely a show. I don't even know what this is. It's definitely a show that'll leave your jaw open the whole entire show. <laughs> yeah, nice. exactly. I think that's the best way to put it. Right. Right. <laughs> Um, but there are other things to watch. Um, Gary Blackwell and XP Metal Detectors just launched a 120 minute, like a feature film length video compilation on their YouTube channel. Uh, it just came out today, so I haven't even had a chance to take a look at it yet. But, um, you know, that's definitely some great stuff, I'm sure. So stop over to their YouTube channel, that X, uh, XP Metal Detectors, and, and check that out. Yes. All right. Yeah. And uh, also, we had our own guys on XP Team USA release some videos too, like Lenny. Yeah, they did a nice job. Um, you know, it's a good it's a good form of social distancing, and uh, you know, you can get out there and be isolated and, and still have a good time and clear your head. So that video just dropped on the XP Team USA YouTube channel. So please check that one out as well. Yes, and uh, today we got to talk to Keith Wills. Keith Wills has his own uh, metal detecting repair shop. Keith is from. Texas, and we get with him and we talk to him a little bit, and he is an interesting guy to talk to. Yeah, he's a real advocate for the hobby and has opened up a lot of spaces across the country and helped a lot of people, so I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation with Keith. And when we get back after that, we will announce the winner of last show's contest, and what do they win? They win an XP Team USA hoodie and an XP Team USA camo cap, so a really nice pa uh, prize package. Yeah, I need to get me one of them camel caps they look pretty cool they look really cool yeah i gotta get my one myself um you know i like that they're fitted so hopefully they'll fit nice and snug and uh just a nice look all right we'll be right back with keith wills If you are looking for more information about XP products such as dealers or updates, then check out MetalDetectorsAmericas.com. Hello, this is Daniel from XP Metal Detectors Americas, and I just wanted to let you know about the XP Metal Detectors Americas.com website, which is full of information on the KNUS Metal Detector and the ORX Metal Detector. Both are wireless and do all aspects of metal detecting, which is gold processing, coins, jewelry, and relics. We'd like to introduce a longtime metal detectorist and advocate for the hobby. He is the owner of East Texas Metal Detectors and owner-operator of BrokenDetector.com. Coming to you from Texas, let us give a warm welcome to Keith Wills. How you doing, Keith? All right, doing good. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Welcome to the show. You know, you've been using metal detectors now for over 30 years. What were they like when you first started? Uh, well, when I first started, they had one knob and they went rear, 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 rear. Actually, the better one I got, Charles Garrett gave to me. I've been doing this 54. Three years, I think it is, and I started out diving on shipwrecks off the Bahamas and Panama, and uh, I finally got into swinging the detector a lot after using one underwater a lot. So, and uh, I went and saw Charles Garrett. I think I was 17 years old once, and met him, and we just hit it off. And he gave me one of his new detectors called Sidewinder, and one knob, BFO, beat frequency, and stuff. And then uh, I just kept hunting, and actually. 
it turned out to be a great hobby for me and my father to be together a lot. And hmm. he didn't have that when he was a kid. So we ended up hitting it off. Come every weekend, he'd pull up out front and open the trunk of the car. And that was just about every weekend during the year. Hmm. I mean, and uh, it didn't make any difference what the weather was outside or how hot or cold it was. I put my stuff in. I said, which way we're we going? He said, I don't know. We're pointed this way. Let's just go this way. And this was before you saw anybody with detectors or a detector shop anywhere. You had to buy them off men's magazines or something like that, ads. And, uh, of course, he always bought one better than what I had, but I finally caught up with him. Bought one better than he had. So. Oh, yeah. So what kind of uh, coins and artifacts did you find in the uh, early days? Well, when you're doing shipwreck stuff, I'm not getting a profit from it all. The guy that owns the, you know, boats and stuff does that. He he has uh, investors invest to pay for the gas and all that stuff. He had a friend over in Spain that could read archaic Spanish and did the research on these wrecks when they went down and what they were carrying, the manifest. And then uh, he put a deal together, and I just use it as a summer vacation. Spent about six weeks with him on a boat, and we go out and recover what whatever valuables we could find. I was just a relief diver, you might say, and Mm. there was three of us on board, two down all the time, and pulling up everything from cannons to money chains. And uh, I was able to cure a few of the paper owls and stuff like that, that we'd come up with hundreds of them off the ship. That must have been such an amazing thrill to find those kinds of things. Yes, it would. Yeah, it's kind of diving in head first on the biggest part, but he had offered me to come to Florida, jump on the boat with him and go out and we would go hunting and uh, diving. I learned a lot of stuff from him and he was, he always appreciated a free diver. <laughs> he didn't have to pay me nothing. He just kept me up and fed me, you know, and it was vacation for me. I was, I was certified with an international dive license too, so I could dive off coastal waters uh, beyond the barrier. So anyway, yeah. and we thought we were going to go to Spain once, and we didn't do it. So I had to have a license to be able to dive for that international. And, and it's quite a uh, challenge right because you have to you can't just dock your boat and dive anywhere you have to get certain permissions and depending on the government or the state you're in right 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 you had to have somebody that would uh, you know from their antiquities to ride with you on the boat Mm -hmm. and when you handed something up like a foyer diver we uh, i dropped a money chain in there it was worth a little over a million dollars one time and uh see back in the 16 15 1600s they they wore the money around their neck. It was a big length, mm-hmm. about the size of the palm of your hand. Mm-hmm. And it was about as big around as your pointing finger. And that length was just a link of gold, and it wore it around their necks. And that's what they walked around with. When they got ready to pay somebody, they'd just separate the link, take it off, and hand it to them. They'd break off what they didn't use, and he'd put it back in his pocket, reconnect the chain. Hmm. That's that's so, that's really if cool. If you had one of those, then when when you did anything with it, you just stuck it in the uh, you know in the basket and they hauled it up, and uh, only him or the archaeologist could touch it. Uh, wow! So when you started, detectors just had a knob and a, and a siren, <laughs> so to speak. Um, how how have you seen the technology? And the quality of metal detectors change over the years. Oh, it's gone a long, long way. You used to have drifting problems in the older type machines occasionally and stuff. And I was always had electronic background. Matter of fact, growing up, uh, everything I got for Christmas and, and my birthday was always some piece of test equipment for electronics. And so uh, I was repairing TVs out in my garage and stuff like that. I made more money than most kids made when they went to work illegal age mm. <laughs> but i was repairing people's tvs radios photographs and uh started there and i had a tv shop once over in canton texas do you think you would credit more on uh some of your finds today uh for the new technology and advancements in metal detectors yes uh back in the day when it was one knob what you had to learn was you learn the width of the signal when you went over it. I was following uh, Charles Garrett got me on to going with a couple of the guys that wrote the books nowadays and, and are passed away by now. And um, I watched them using the same kind of detector Charles gave me. And um, so I just paid
paid attention, watched how they used it, how they walked with it, and so on, and, and tried to copy them. And I was, you know, like I said, about 17 years old, and they're sitting around the campfire. Night, they're not telling jokes and stuff like that. They're talking about how, how they found this particular item, how they knew it was a coin, or how they knew it was a piece of jewelry, with nothing but one knob, and you just set the squelch on the sound. And my yeah. father always taught me, keep your mouth shut, sit there, and you'll learn. So... <laughs> sit around the right. campfire and they used to call me greener you know what greener is right i do not watch don't watch enough john wayne huh no anyway <laughs> i guess not <laughs> yeah a greener is a somebody that can't hit with any other type of gun so they sawed off shotgun is called a greener <laughs> called sawed off I, have, so I have heard that technique from an older gentleman <laughs> that used to detect uh way back when that he would listen to the length of this signal by he would put it in pinpoint right. mode and and go and cross and see how long the signal is and i'll tell you a lot that is a good technique yes it's something you tune your ear to finally and once you get to that point it's not that hard but you still uh, were very elusive to what in the world it would be you could say okay it was it's going to be a coin or jewelry or something like that all you knew it was something and small and after digging enough after a while well yes then you could kind of get to where you knew what it was so as someone who fixes detectors what are some of the more common problems you've seen with them uh, I would say people putting it up with the batteries in it, probably the worst. Uh, <laughs> they all have it in a closet or downstairs in a wet cellar or out in the garage. And I've literally seen them bring it in where I couldn't even see the face of the machine because it had half inch of dirt on it. You know, you couldn't read the controls or anything. And the batteries are just clogged up with all kinds of stuff on it. And, uh, you know, it's just all corroded. You have to do a lot of cleaning, try to clean it up or put it back like new. That's what we do most of the time. I don't do any warranty work. All mine's out of warranty. And, of course, you know, to, we were just talking about Tesoro going out. And so I was pretty much inundated there for half a year there, pretty much, of just Tesoro's coming in because they had no place to go. Yeah. For them. And now that they're gone out of business, a lot of people that are have them older machines like that are looking for people to fix them. So I guess you would be the guy to contact on that, right? I don't know if anybody else fixes them unless Rusty that used to work for him up there is doing it on the side, but I haven't heard anything like that, so I don't know. The text from most of the different uh, manufacturers because they all talk to me and I talk to them. So, so what uh, can people do to protect their metal detectors from wear or malfunction? Well, there's Really, what you do, there's a kind of dividing point, and you find out that that divide. If you're working on a detector, you need to know whether to go backwards or forwards with the problem. And the way to do that is find out if you have power supply. And that's not at the battery so much as it is actually in the circuitry on the board that you've got the positive and negative voltage that you're supposed to have on that circuit. If you don't, then you go backwards to the batteries and uh, instead of going towards the coil and find out what the problem is. And sometimes you can have multiple problems, especially if it's been abused pretty bad. And sometimes they're not worth fixing. Sometimes I just have to drop the ax and tell them, look, you can buy this thing for half the price it would take to fix it. Buy mm -hmm. another one on or something or a better one. So I just, you know, I have to break it to them either way, but we have kind of a unique system here that I've been using since like 1982 when I started. And that's, uh, I just tell them, you know, if it's, $100 or less, we'll go ahead and fix it and call you up uh, and make sure you put your phone number in the box and we'll call you up and tell you what we did and, and we'll ship it back to you. But uh, if it looks like it's going to go over 100 we'd rather call you first and, and ask you if you want to go that far. That's good, yeah. Um, give people the option. And we'll be right back with Keith Wills. This is Michael from XP Metal Detectors Americas. Be sure to check out the new XP ORX Metal Detector, models starting at $649. This segment is brought to you by Omega Mill Pouches, the official digging pouch of XP Team USA. If you're looking for a rugged, hunt-tested, washable pouch, look no further than Omega Mill. Get on eBay and search Omega Mill Pouches. That's O M E G. A-M-I-L-L. -L. And we're back with Keith Wills. 
Uh, so you are involved with, with a great group. Can you please tell us about the Texas Lions Camp for Disabled Children and, and what your role is with it? Well, you know, it's kind of a thing that went to my heart there. Um, I had a real good friend. He passed away. His name was Nolan Underwood. He was raised in that handicapped children's camp that's Texas Lions Camp of Handicapped Children. And uh, anyway, they have you know, the deaf and the blind and the wheelchair children out there. Now, I got to give you something that you wouldn't hardly believe, and that's telling you how educated these kids are. They can't run out and play like other children, and they spend their time on computers and stuff like that, indoor stuff. Well, both Nolan and I were treasure hunters, and Nolan's totally blind, and he was raised in that camp, and then he became the activity director for the camp, and he's blind. And I bought him a metal detector from Garrett that talked to him, you know, telling him what's down there and how many inches he had to dig, and if he pinpointed it dead center and stuff like that. And I tell you, the man's beat me so many times out in the field, and he's a blind person. Mm. <laughs> This is not right, man. I've got all these years in it, and you, you go over there and find a big old gold ring that would choke a horse if he tried to swallow it. But anyway, he was the luckiest guy I ever saw in my life, and he'd get such a kick out of us hunting together, especially if he showed me up and stuff. So uh, anyway, we got to talking about it at the camp, and he said, you know, I really think the kids, even though they with their handicaps, we could teach them how to use those and it'd be another activity for the camp that I've never heard of in a camp like that before. And I said, well, yeah, why don't we try that? So we worked on it for about a year and figured out what we we're going to have to do. And I went to Charles Garrett, and he donated a dozen metal detectors to the camp, and they were all beginner units, but that's all they needed. And uh, I offset the frequencies of all the detectors so they wouldn't talk to each other if they get close to one another. And so uh, I did that and took it to the camp and I presented it to the head of the camp there. And um, and they said, yes, we'd be very interested in that. So what we started out with was we buried silver coins. Well, we found out the first year that the children there are not allowed to have any money. They only drink healthy drinks, and if they got to one of the counselor's Coke machines, they fill it full of money, and, of course, that's what happened to us. They were filling it full of silver coins. <laughs> I don't know who takes care of that Coke machine, but he's probably a happy camper that day when he unloaded that money. But we, I had a couple of hands full of foreign coins. I put them out there, and the kids just went crazy for them. They, they had coins of different countries. And uh, so we started just getting them foreign coins, which really are not worth anything. But to the children, it's worth a lot. Having coins from Denmark or Austria or something of that nature. And over the years, it's nearly, it's 20 plus, I'd say it's around 25, 26 years now that we've been teaching it to the children at the camp. And what we do is annual visit. We go to the camp, and the counselors they use to work with the kids, there are foreign students. Evidently, they have to have so many hours or something for their grades to work with the children, handicapped children. And uh, so, you know, I think last year it was Australia and uh, Germany. Uh, German uh, children and our, our counselors, teenagers. And working with the kids in Australia. But anyway, they some of the coins that we end up getting donated for this are from their country. They know them well. And the children get an education out of it as well as go around with the detector and find it. So we had to learn to teach if they were blind how to use a metal detector blind. If they were deaf, how to be able to handle a detector and know that it's going off, which we have a little light that we can put in there and flashes at them, or they can feel the speaker vibrate when it goes off in their hand. You know, their abil disabilities make their other abilities enhanced. Does that spark uh, their interest in foreign currency or foreign history? Absolutely. That's what we found that we had no idea would do that. Just a double handful I had that day when we first worked with them. It was only 110 the shade that day, but anyway, when we did that, just blew us away and said, well, what we need is foreign coins, and that'll be easy to get for them because they're so cheap. Most coin stores sell them by the pound. You buy a pound, pound, two pounds, five pounds, and they're fairly cheap compared to any other type of coin you put out there. <clears throat> right now, we're in need, of, we're always been in need of donations of foreign coins. But somebody last year, 
don't know. I don't think it's anybody in the camp. I think somebody visited the camp, found our five-gallon bucket of coins that we used for the children, and it disappeared. So well, it mm. took us about 10 years to build that five-gallon bucket. But uh, mm. well, the donations I get during the year on these coins, people send me that or send me money for me to go buy them some more coins. So if there's other people who are interested in donating to this Texas Lions camp, uh, how can they go about that? All the treasure clubs in Texas do. Just about every one of them will donate and find foreign coins for them during the year and give me so many pounds of foreign coins each club. Okay. So with, with this amazing experience that these kids have, can you give me an example of how being part of the Texas Lions camp has positively influenced like one of the kids' lives? Do you have like an, a good inspirational story around that? Yeah. Uh, the idea of the camp is for them to learn. You have to look at where they're at. Um, usually they're picked on in just public schools and stuff like that uh, for their disability. And here when they get to the camp, everybody's on the same ground. Everybody has something disability of some type. And so they, you know, they learn to work with each other because really in school, public schools, they don't get that. Uh, people, uh, you're in a wheelchair, get away from you, you're blind or whatever, and they just pick on the kids. Well, there, everybody's got this something wrong with them and they learn to share. And when we do this, taking the kids out and hiding coins under the leaves and stuff for them, foreign coins in a field that we have underneath a bunch of pin oaks, they, um, there on the camp, we make sure that we get three or four in each group where they have to learn to hand the detector to the next kid and let them dig two, and then to the next kid and let them dig two, and then to the counselor. He has to dig some too. And so he knows how to work it when we're gone. We can't stay up there all the time, and I have, oh, sometimes as many 10 clubs, uh, two or three representatives from each club coming out there just to uh, help us at, at the visitation that we have. This year, it's June 3rd and 4th of this year, and we go out there and we appreciate anybody who wants to assist them. And we show them how to work with the kids and the different ways that we do deaf or blind or wheelchair. It's a good education. <laughs> So are are other states or other countries modeling their own camps after the Texas Lions camp? Well, uh, I would say possibly, but this particular uh, activity that we started here in Texas at the Texas Lions camp some 20-something years ago, the um, what Nolan and I didn't know, and Nolan's passed away now, but what Nolan and I didn't know was that it would go all the way around the world because of the foreign counselors they had. Mm. They go back to their home country and they have similar camps for their handicapped and they're introducing this metal detecting in their camp. And literally what we started here in Texas 20 something years ago has gone global. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. Never thought of it, but it really has gone global. And it's really great for a hobby, see. And so, uh, it, you know, I've always been a big, uh, big guy about doing uh, something for your community. And now it's what we've done is gone global. That's just the way outside of the box thinking. Mm -hmm. But right. uh, yeah. it really turned out great. Oh, yeah. So uh, what kind of advice would you give uh, anyone who wants to introduce any other child uh, who special needs or not to mm -hmm. metal detecting? Well, <clears throat> But what I tell a lot of my customers, and th and this works even as as adult, but it's even better with the kids. As you know, a lot of this play playground equipment and parks and stuff are in a kind of a gravel area where they bounce the swings and the slides and stuff. And kids, when they're riding on a swing, they'll lose money out of their pocket or playing around on the slide, they'll lose money out there. And I say, well, if you want to get used to the detector and kind of learn it first, go to one of those gravel places like that. And I tell mothers, take their children when they get one for Christmas or something there. It's easy digging that gravel, see, and they don't have to work so hard to get a hole going. And they'll pick up pennies, dimes, quarters. Sometimes even mama pushing the kid's swing lost a wedding band out there or something. And so toy cars and that gravel, and it gets them started. And once they see that, they... Uh, there's a gleam in their eye that just doesn't go away. I've seen it too many times at the camp. It's wonderful. If you're ever given a chance to metal detect yeah. anywhere in the United States, it's always been off limits to metal detecting. Where do you think you would hunt? Well, uh, you know, I was a big advocate about opening state parks in Texas, and they're still not open. Mm. It 
turns out that Parks and Wildlife, they have somebody up there that wants that to never happen. And what I've helped them open them in Arkansas and Mexico and New Mexico and Louisiana. And it's all out. All you do is come in, sign in, tell them that you're going to be out there, metal detecting shirt. Go ahead. Now, anything historical coming out of the ground, we know that if it's on state land or city land, that we ought to turn it in, and we do so. Otherwise, it'd be in the ground and rot. Uh, nobody would get any beneficial not being able to see it. So, but Texas is a little bit different. And when you get to the National Resource Committee in the House, they got one person that will vote against it every time and just ride the bill until it drops out. I put five bills in now in it, trying to open state parks in Texas, and it was more to do it. But right. um, mm-hmm. the other states, there's 38 states that allow it. Yeah, I bet there's and a lot of good so stuff in Texas. Yeah. And yeah. I would prefer to hunt there because there's... There is history in a lot of those state parks, not all of them, but a lot of them. And I just feel like that history recovered would be great in a museum somewhere. And I've donated a lot of things to museums over the years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Keith, you know, you're certainly doing a wonderful thing and you're reaching an amazing population. So I want to say thank you for that. And please keep us posted on the events that you have that were canceled. Maybe they'll be rescheduled. We'd love to promote them for you and and bring more awareness to these events. Oh, yeah. Been to Washington, D.C., court cases everywhere up against the Arrowhead Collector and against the Somebody dug in the National Forest and all this kind of stuff. I've been to all those court cases and what have you. And I just try to keep them out of, out of trouble and stuff. I'm the guy that went to the Army Corps of Engineers in 89 and uh, made the first metal detecting policy in America. And uh, it's still intact today. I don't know how. <laughs> Since 89, I figured it would last two years, but it's still there. But I thought. I have to say, and this is strange, but the best intelligence I ever met in my life was the chiefs and the Army Corps of Engineers in Washington, D.C. I'm not sure anybody else in Washington, D.C. has got sense, but they do. And so they really appreciate us and their swimming areas, with sharp stuff, even taking the glass out and throwing it in their cans or our cans. And, and uh, we recover a lot of stuff and return it to the owners and stuff like that. And that was the idea back then is to be able to help other people out. Mm. And uh, mm. we're still allowed in core, but only on designated areas, which is swimming and uh, swimming area and the beaches and the volleyball courts and stuff like that. Well, Keith, I mean, we could talk to you all night, all day. Um, <laughs> you've got tons of stories and, I, you know, we'd love to have you back on the show sometime so we can uh, continue sure. the conversation. But, um, you know, in the meantime, good luck with everything. Hopefully coronavirus will pass soon and you can get back to having those events and, and, and really helping out those kids. We really appreciate it. We're interested in donating foreign coins to them. Just, they can just send it to me at East Texas Metal Detector or go brokendetector.com got my address and my phone number and email on there and uh, i'll be glad to help anybody out with any problem that they got if they want to get hold of me it doesn't cost them anything to call me all right well we'll see you thanks keith yep. appreciate it all right bye. all right bye. thanks a lot bye. bye check us out online at xpdais-usa.com Hi, this is Dave D. Hi, this is Sonia. R.C. Dunn. This is Alan. Yep. We're the Minnesota Beach Boys. This is Kendall. This is David Kimball. This is Grant Hansen. Dean Center. Lynn Quellen. Hi, this is John. Josh Kemmel. Cameron Macer. Pete Sorrell. And we are. And we are. And we are XP Team USA. And you are listening to the Metal Detecting Podcast. All right, well, we're back. And that was Keith. And we were usually had our express news right after our interviews, but uh, Kendall Atkins has been really busy with all this virus stuff. He's running a school right now and he has a lot of things going on. So we are giving him some slack and take, letting him take a break on that. And we will get back to him with express news on a further show. Yeah. He's doing some great stuff up in Vermont, working with some really uh, amazing kids and making sure that they're supplied with Chromebooks so that they could do virtual learning. So it's a lot to tackle on top of being a dad to newborn twins. So he's definitely got his hands full. And uh, I just want to remind everybody out there, stay safe, 
you know, keep your distance from everybody. Wash your hands, buy some hand sanitizer, use soap, um, stay inside. Don't go out unless you're, it's absolutely necessary or at least keep away from everybody. I mean, by all means, get out there and metal detect, but just keep your distance from people. And, you know, uh, hopefully we'll get through this pretty soon and get back to our lives yeah i have a feeling when we get through this it's going to be a fantastic summer for everybody (laughs) because we're going to be just blazing to get out of the house oh yeah yeah (laughs) i I know uh some companies are really hurting but i bet there are there are a lot of companies that are thriving right now like netflix and deliveries and yeah you know yeah definitely grocery stores too they're just uh you know nonstop busy people instead of spending 100 bucks a week or spending 300 bucks a week like my my wife so (laughs) oh yeah when all this is said and done everybody's gonna ever all the essential workers anyways are gonna just have all their money saved up because they haven't been able to get out and do anything so i'm sure a lot of a lot of companies are gonna thrive from that yeah exactly Exactly. Uh, so, well, and order some well, silver and stuff now. And oh, silver's down. Good I've time. been looking into that. You know, I don't understand the market that much, but I, you and I had a, a chat about it uh, last week. So I definitely got to get back onto that and maybe invest in that a little bit. Yeah, because yeah. right when this is over, it's probably going to go back up fast. Yes, I'm sure it will. So we've got our contest winner to announce. If you remember our last show, we interviewed Billy Newman. He's an expert on Robert Erskine, who was George Washington's map maker. And Robert Erskine signed three initials to his name anytime he signed his name. So that was the trivia question. What three initials did Robert Erskine put next to his name? And the correct answer was FRS. So we had a bunch of entries. So I'm going to go through a random number generator and pick a lucky winner who's going to win that XP Team USA hoodie and XP Team USA hat. Here we go. I'm going to click it. Good luck, everybody. And thank you for listening and entering our contest. All right. So the number four came up, and that means that the winner is Ryan Chick. Congratulations, Ryan. Congratulations, Ryan Chick. You won a hoodie and a camouflage hat. XP Team USA hat. Yeah, Ryan, if you can, uh, send me an email with your mailing address and the size that you want for your hoodie and the size that you would want for your fitted cap. And uh, once you get it, please t- take a picture and post it for us. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the show. We will be back on uh, April 17th, and we will see you then. Take care, everybody. Right. See you. Get that permission, put the coil to the soil, and we'll catch you next time right here on the Metal Detecting Podcast, brought to you by XP Metal Detectors.